But now to our speaker tonight, the incomparable Bernadette Brady, known to us all as one of astrology's most penetrating thinkers. Her identification of the Saros eclipse cycles, her rediscovery of the use of the local horizon in fixed star work, and the fact that she champions best astrological practice at all times has made her one of the leading astrologers of our times. Bernadette has an MA from the University of Wales Trinity St David in cultural astronomy and astrology, as well as a PhD in anthropology, also from Trinity St David, where she is a tutor. Bernadette is also co-director of Astro Logos. In 2006, uh, Bernadette was awarded the Charles Harvey Award for Exceptional Service to Astrology. And in 2008, when at UAC, she received the Regulus Award in Theory and Understanding in Astrology. The wonderful thing about inviting a scholar such as Bernadette is that she's engaged in continuous research. Since thinking about this webinar's subject, uh, her study has taken her even deeper into the history of flu pandemics. Bernadette, I know you have refocused what you're going to talk about, so over to you to tell us more. All right. Thank you, Graham. Thank you for that um, very generous and warm introduction. Um, thank you pleasure. very much and to the whole committee as well. Um, bear with me while I upload my PowerPoint and then we can make a start. Okay. Can everybody see that PowerPoint? Yes. Great. Thank you, Graham. Okay. And Graham, if you can keep an eye on the chat box, because I can't see it um, yes. while I'm I doing will. this, and uh, then you can collect the questions for me. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Graham was quite right um, and uh, about the shift of focus. And so when Graham asked me to do this, I said, yes and I want to focus it on the stars and the flu. And not having looked at that, <laughs> I'm leaping off the edge. Um, so I proceeded to look at it. And that was really interesting. But then that pushed me into a deeper levels of planetary analysis. So what I want to do tonight with people is to in, almost take you on the journey of my journey into this subject and then get you to the point where of the conclusion to my thinking on astrology and uh, the flu pandemics, plural. So that, that's the process. So there are two distinct parts to this lecture. One is where we reach for the stars and consider that. And the other where we go from the stars into nuts and bolts, meat and potato, planetary analysis to sort of distill and hunt for um, flu patterns. And I think I've found one which I want to share with you. Um, so this is the process we're going to go on. I'm going to take you on the journey of my thinking. And if there's parts of it, if you're not too sure of the actual technique I've used, don't jam on that. Just follow, trust me and follow me. You can disagree at the end, right? But just follow, go on the journey. You bought your ticket, sit on the bus, and enjoy the ride and we'll see where we get to. Okay, so logically, at least logically for me, when I started to think about the stars and the flu, and, and I'd been obviously thinking about it for some time, it seemed to me, not just this flu, but generally pandemics, that the planet Neptune had a lot to be, to had to answer for. That because if something is Pluto, it's like a war, it's in your face and there's the enemy and, and here's the challenge and et cetera, et cetera. But something which you can't see and something which just creeps through and something which can annihilate without you knowing, the hidden enemy, which has been so often called, um, to me, that's Neptune country. So I was on red alert looking for Neptune and any relationship to stars. But there's a fundamental problem when you want to get into looking at stars, because as you know, I work with Parans. Um, there's a fundamental problem that they are local specific. They're very location specific, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant for a natal chart because they, they, they really nail your moment in your place and capture something I think quite precious. But, but a pandemic is not a local event. 
So the first thing I did was I thought, well, we all know, well, we think we know where it started and we know roughly when it started. So it started here probably earlier than early December, but we start to get rumblings of it there in Wuhan in China. And this is Wuhan in China. So this is a particular place. So we can start to look at what was going on in terms of the params and the mundane meanings. Now, I've drawn on, I've simply, I haven't rewritten these, I've simply put this chart into starlight and just simply get it to delineate the parans. And I'm going to look at the shift of local parans from November through to 2020, January. So that's, that's the plan, people. That's what we're doing. So in early November, we're looking at Neptune, Neptune was rising as Bellatrix, which is the left shoulder of Orion, was on the Nadir. Now, that in itself is not a big problem. Do you know, like, this is not a red alert band. This is like, okay, hard one successes, slips away. That's, this is a localised event and not enough to raise up a flag. At the same time, Neptune was rising when Elnath was on the Nadir. This is sort of half flag. Elnath is the tip of this horn this is just off the top of the slide it's a star in the charging bull of taurus and it's the tip of the horn that's heading towards you that gives you the sense of what elnath represents in fixed star word so we've got a sense of hopelessness no control over unfolding circumstances and acts of nature you get a sense that this is when the virus is starting to creep out from their strict control and they're starting to lose it right so this is the this is the panic in the Communist Party trying to contain it. So if we just push it on, these don't move quickly, but these are very localised because Neptune's not moving fast and the stars aren't moving at all, apart from their 24-hour cycle. But if Neptune's going to be rising with, with Betelgeuse on the Nadir, that's going to happen for a while. So we push into January, mid-January now, and we keep the Elnath, the tip of the bull, so we've still got this hopelessness happening. And we keep Bellatrix, but we get a new star coming in, which is Argol, which is most people, most astrologers know Argol. It's the face of the head of the Gorgon in the constellation Perseus. And the simple meaning for that, the starlight gives, is fatal accidents, loss of life. So this is, something's going wrong in Wuhan. We don't know what it is really, if we're just looking at this, you know, but this is not a happy time in Wuhan. This could be some environmental issues. It could be, it could be local government issues. It could be a riot that gets put down too vigorously. You know, this is not giving us a lot of particulars. It's giving us themes of the energy in the in the city. When we push this into February, late January and into February, something happens. We keep the, we keep our goal. We keep Elnath, and then this character pops up. And this is important. Zosma is the back of the line where the line is crushed by Hercules. It's a point of being a victim, being crushed. But what's more important, if it was rising or setting, it would just be part of the background wash, but it's not. Neptune was culminating when Zosma was on the Nadir. Now, as soon as you see that in fixed star parans, where you've got one star, culminating or on the nadir and the slow moving planet is on the other or on the same when they're on that icmc axis that makes it global that pushes whatever's going on it pushes it around the world now there could be stuff going on in new york this would happen in new york as well and that pushes around the world something is happening around the world we can see this now. I've used every bit of software with this talk, Graham. Right? I've yeah. used my whole <laughs> kit bag of stuff, right? Great. This is um, Solify. This is Maps, the map <coughs> option Solify. And what I've done is I've simply set it up so that it's only showing me Neptune and it's only showing me the Neptune culminating points. And I've also got it to show me the star Zosma. And if you can't see that, I've sort of highlighted it here. Now, what we've actually got is that Zosma and Neptune are culminating or on the ice at the same time. They're on that axis. They're swapping back and forth. Here's, here they are here again. This is six hours later. 
Now, this isn't just happening through Africa, which is just the diagram I've got there. This actually sweeps through the whole globe every 24 hours. It just keeps rolling around. This line passes through Australia, passes through China, passes through Russia, goes down into Saudi Arabia, hits through into Africa, sweeps through Europe, goes across the Pacific, sorry, the Atlantic, and then hits uh, United, South America, and then we've got the United States and Canada, and just keeps rolling along. It just keeps rolling like that every 24 hours. This makes it, whatever is happening, is happening around the world. Every single place, every single village, city, town, hamlet, single household, desert island, rock, every single place, if you look at their parans, will get this paran on their printout. And that's important to understand. And I thought, as a researcher, I thought, fantastic. <laughs> Got it. Particularly, as we look at this, it's happening, it started in about June, July of 2019, rumblings. It's really peaking through the January, February. You can see it's getting tired. Here it is in February, which is just gone, still really tired. This is literally the orb between the two, still really tired. And the question one asks is how long does it take to move? And it's not, and recognize this is moving through, rotating like that. And it's not until, wait for it, people, the summer of next year where this starts to break up. And that's, I think, is the first clue as to how long this is going to go on for. So it's actually going to be, Neptune's going to push through to about 22 degrees, and I think that's going to be about a four degree orb away from Zosma and hopefully then that starts to split it up. So this is the first indication we've got that, and this is really interesting and there's a whole, then I could have segued off into another whole lecture on looking at the world situation with slow moving planets picking up very difficult stars on their ICMC axis and drifting across the planet. That's opened up a whole question for future research but what would be what would have been easy then is if for other flu pandemics i found the same fixed star pattern and of course you know what astrology is like <laughs> it's not going to do that and i found some patterns but nothing that you could really get your teeth into and what I realised that with the stars in this way, looking at these um, parans which are, were on the culminating and, and nadir point, that it can definitely flag up this is a difficult time for planet Earth. And it, once you pick up on a tag that you can put your finger on, as in this case with COVID-19 and Zosma and Neptune, it's got the right sort of signature to it then you can get an idea of how long it's going to last, which is the summer of next year, which is not a shock for any of us in the room. But you couldn't predict from that. You know, you couldn't see that in the future and, and, and point at it and say, that's going to be a flu pandemic. And I got, I got to the point I wanted to see if I could find something which we could use in the future to actually understand um, what's going on. So I come back to stars a little later on in terms of constellations and sky images. But what I switched to then was doing good bread and butter astrology, planetary analysis. So, of course, with any analysis, you have to ask the question, what is the history of pandemics or flus or plagues on the planet that we have? Well, these are the major ones, and, and this was not necessarily deep research. This is Google and general websites, so there could be errors, but checking a few, a bit of cross-referencing, sorting them out. 430 BC, there was the plague, normally probably the Bonic Plague, in Athens, and that lasted for five years. I think that's important to think about these sort of years, because we're sort of upset that this has lasted for a few months. So imagine if there was something like the plague, which killed you, killed everybody, and it was in your community for five years. So uh, that's something to sit with. 
there was a smallpox plague that killed five million people that went for 15 years. So that's another interesting one. There was a plague that was considered to mark the end of the world from 20, 2050, or sorry, 250 to 271. That's a 21 year plague that went through Europe and it was considered to be, this is it for the Christians, this is the end of the world. And in one day, 5,000 people died in Rome and that's running for 21 years. We've got another plague, the, the plague again, uh, 1541 to 1542. So that's a, just running for one or two years. And that was the bubonic plague. And that was thought to be, to be one of the markers or one of the reasons or the catalyst for the end of the Byzantine Empire. So these things are powerful. Then of course, the one we all know about, the Black Death through Europe, 1346, 1353, roughly those dates. It really comes and goes for about 300 years. And that clocked up in mere 350 to 375 million deaths and nearly wiped out the human population. The first, what they think was the first flu plague or flu pandemic, I should say, correction, was 1510 that went through Europe. And although it's, it's recorded and the symptoms that were written down seem to suggest what we would recognise as influenza. Right? So it's, this is a possibility, our first flu emerging as a pandemic in 1510. There's a horrible illness in 1545 that goes for three years through Mexico and Central America, probably Ebola-like. They haven't been able to work out what the pathogen was from the description, but it's not flu, um, it's something else. And then in 1580, we get the first really recorded pandemic of flu. The symptoms are well recorded, the autopsies are well analysed, and it is, according to contemporary medicine, classic flu. So this is established as the first recorded flu pandemic in 1580. And then we've got the Great Plague of London, which was particular for London, that's bubonic, and then also we have the Russian plague in the 18th century, and that's also bubonic. So in terms of flu pandemics, which are the ones we haven't really been able to sort out, we've got 1510 and 1580. So let's look at those. Now, clearly we don't have a, a start date. We don't have a, a clear start date. We don't have a clear place, right? So we've got, I've basically, I've done this for like February of 1510 to sort of get an idea of just what the planets are doing. And clearly, I'm not going to take any notice of the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter. Um, I'm just going to, you know, because they're moving around too much. So you just throw up a chart and look at it. You know, good old fashioned old boots astrology. Just simply look at the chart. And of course, something that leaps out the page and it's probably already leapt out before I highlighted it here, is that there's a Saturn-Uranus opposition and Neptune is playing around in similar degrees. Happens to be making a trine and sextile, but what we've got is those three planets in similar degrees. Now, it may mean nothing, but you think, right, okay, that's interesting. Let's just sit with that and let's keep looking at charts. So we go to 1580, and it's some 70 years later, um, and um, it begins in Asia in the summer. So this is sort of like a summer chart. Um, this is the sun's 22 Aquarius, so it's February, March, isn't it? Um, and um, it runs for about six months and then trickles right through Europe. And the death toll is unknown, but there were 8,000 8, deaths occurred in Rome alone. And when we look at this chart, this is what we see. It's a Saturn-Uranus conjunction. And oh my God, there's Neptune again. <laughs> you think, okay, that's two ticks in that box. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> so the first question, or the question for me that emerged then was, how often did Saturn-Uranus form? Um, an opposition or a conjunction 
uh, in the in the year seventy years from fifteen ten to to the end of fifteen eighty. So this is just it's just a simple question. How how often between the fifteen ten and fifteen eighty? How often was this happening? So going back into solar um, solar fire again, and this is just a transit grid. I set it up for one hundred and eighty degrees. So every time the line crosses, that's the two planets are forming a conjunction or an opposition. They're related by 180 degrees or zero. The blue line, wavy line, is Uranus, and the brown one is Saturn. Okay, so every time you see these lines cross, for those of you who are not familiar with graphic ephemeris, just every time you see them cross, just look up in here at the dates, and it'll tell you roughly the date. And if we look at that, we see here we have the 1510 outbreak I've already talked about. Uranus and Saturn together, they're in opposition. Uranus is in Aries, Saturn is in Neptune, and we get um, this occurring. And it just so happened, if you simply look it up in the ephemeris, Neptune's in the same degrees, which we know. The next one we got was here in the 1530s. Here it is. And it just so happened that Neptune was not in the same degrees. Then the next one is here in the 1556-57, and that's a Uranus Saturn opposition, just like this was, but Neptune is not in the same degree. And then we've got the pandemic of 1580, just here, and we've got a, a Saturn Uranus conjunction, and Neptune was in the same degree. Is this making sense to people? It's sort of people, someone nod. <laughs> right. Making sense? Good. I got a thumbs up from Mary. Good. Excellent. Okay, so you start to think, hmm, something going on here. Let's push it into um, the contemporary period. Oh, before we did, I'll always turn to look at the stars or the sky. So I was curious about what was going on in terms of the sky map. And in 1510 with the Neptune. It was here, it was in the back end of Capricorn. This is Capricorn. These are the, these are not the zodiac signs. These are the constellation images, okay? So this is the stars of Capricorn, and this is the stars of Aquarius. This is the flow of the urn. This is his urn here. So just make a note, Uranus, Neptune is in that area. And then looking at it for the 1580 situation, the Saturn Uranus is has replaced the Neptune in the same part of the sky. So this is me, I'm just gathering data, just simply having a look at what's going on. So let's go to the modern period, the modern era. The first flu pandemic we have in the modern period is in 1890 to 1892, it was called the Russian flu. Europe had just been opened up by the railways. They just put a railway line straight through Russia to the rest of Europe. This started in St. Petersburg and then picked up, bought a railway ticket and traveled across Europe, um, taking off at every stop it could as it went along the way. And there were about a million people died in this particular pandemic. So here's one we can have a look at. 1918, of course, the end of the First World War, the Spanish flu, called the Spanish flu because it actually broke out in all different parts of Europe. But those countries, the countries who were at war, didn't want to talk about it because for propaganda reasons with the war. So Spain was neutral in the First World War. So they all reported on the flu from Spain. So it became known as the Spanish flu but it did not originate in Spain. This was the granddaddy of all flus. We never want to see this one again. 17 to 15 million people died. It killed you within, almost within one or two days of getting it. And it affected everybody, young, old, or whatever. So this is, this is really difficult flu. Then there wasn't another one until 1957. And this got called the Asian flu because it came out of Asia. Um, and there were one and a half million deaths. And you can see there's all sorts of masks going on and personal protection and so on. And there was also a sense of self-isolating. 
And that went on for about 18 months. But what's interesting, 10 or 11 years later, very quickly, we had the Hong Kong flu. I can remember that one. That's, that started out of Hong Kong, spread through the rest of the world as the little map was showing, and there were a million people died with that one. And then all was quiet for a while until we get 2009 and 10, the swine flu pandemic. Here in the UK, we didn't notice that so much, although it was here. There were a half a million deaths worldwide. Um, and we'll look at these charts as we go along. But that's the swine flu. And then we have this one now, our friend, COVID-19, which interestingly now is not being called after a country or after an animal. It's not being called China flu. It's not being called bat flu, which in a sense how we name things starts to change our relationship to them. So we're actually now taking these, we're, less, we're making it less personal and taking them more serious probably. So let's look at these charts. Let's, given what we've learned from the two pandemics in the 1500s, let's carry that forward to now. Let's look at the Russian flu. Graham, you sing out when you need me to pause, right? I'm aware of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. The, Five the, minutes. Yeah, excellent. The Russian flu. Um, if we look at this chart, we actually have, I'll just take that off for a second. We have a Pluto-Neptune conjunction with Saturn squaring it. Not, not, not the Uranus that we normally look for, but definitely that's an interesting planetary combination. And the Neptune-Pluto conjunction only happens every 492 years. So it's a bit rare. And the Saturn square makes you think, how often does that happen? So with that question in my mind, how often does this happen? I turned to Jigsaw. So as I said, Ukraine, I used every bit of kit I had. <laughs> well done. Jigsaw, um, in Jigsaw, which is a research, astrological research product, which, which um, I helped design. I, I actually did design it, but I, you, I built it with esoteric technologies. Um, what you can do in Jigsaw um, is you can put a whole hunk of ephemeris, get it to create ephemeris, and then you can get it to scan that ephemeris for a particular planetary pattern. So in this particular search, I got it to upload 2,000 years of ephemeris, basically from, 20, from the year 2000 back to the year dot. And then I ask it to look for every time there was a Neptune-Pluto conjunction with an orbit plus or minus five degrees. So I was generous, kept it wide, whilst at the same time, at the same time, Saturn was squaring Neptune. I could have said Saturn squaring Pluto. I just wanted Saturn squaring the conjunction with the same sort of orb, plus or minus five. And I let it run. I had to go and make a cup of tea while it, while it ran. But when it came back, it said, there's only one. There is only once in the last 2000 years where we've had a Saturn squaring and Neptune-Pluto conjunction. And that was in October 1889 to July 1891. I thought, right, okay. So this isn't necessarily saying this will be a pandemic called Russian flu, but it's definitely an extremely unique planetary configuration. And we would expect some very unique or unusual event to affect the whole world in this time because of the sheer rarity of the planetary combination. So, okay, we go to the Spanish flu. And I think I can fit the Spanish flu in before we go and clap. This is a Saturn cycle after the other one. So the Saturn here in this one, the Saturn's three degrees of Virgo. And here for the Spanish flu is 27 of Leo. So it's 28 years later, it's a Saturn cycle has gone along. And there's not a lot that makes you leap and bound here. I mean, this is the worst thing that's ever happened in terms of flu. But it is a Saturn-Uranus opposition. So we've got our marker again, and it is a Saturn return on the Russian flu. 
And that in itself doesn't sort of, this would not, you wouldn't think it would be as bad as what it was, but it's almost like it's an echo of the Russian flu. Um, there's something going on there because the two times are really quite connected. And going into the sky, 1918, here's Uranus again back in the same place in the sky amongst the same group of stars, drifting between Capricorn and Aquarius. Okay. Oh, Bernadette, sorry to interrupt. No. It's 7.59. Yep. So those of us in the UK who want to clap the carers, um, we will come back and resume the meeting in five minutes, or just six minutes. Okay, so see you then. Okay, so it was good to have a break anyway. Move around, clap, jump up and down on the spot. <laughs> um, okay, so we're continuing on this journey of discovery, like just trying to see if we can see what's happening and what's going on. So we've had a look at, um, just recapping, this. we've had a look at the uh, Spanish flu and now we move with, there's a real leap from 1918 to 1957 and we get the Asian flu. Um, one and a half million deaths. Now this one is an odd one. I think that's the easiest way I can put it. We've got a Uranus-Neptune square which is not necessarily what we're looking for and in this year that the flu runs in 57 and 58 Saturn gets into this degrees as well, which is interesting, but never at the same time as the other two. Do you know there's a bit of tag going on? You never sort of get all three planets in a nice little grouping. So to be honest with you, you wouldn't sort of pick up that this is really a difficult time. Except, and just bearing that in mind, what we actually get then, 10 years later, we get the Hong Kong flu, which is the same virus as the Asian flu, but it had just morphed into and picked up with another one. And um, this, start, this is sort of the classic flu, which is more fatal for the older population. And what they did with the Hong Kong flu is they let it run for herd, herd immunity. They simply let it run through. Germany alone had 60,000 deaths and at one stage half the population of the workforce of Germany was on sick leave. I've just got to close my door. The dogs get really excited with all the clapping. <laughs> and with this one we're coming back to a sort of signature we would now start to anticipate that we've got Uranus, Neptune and Saturn all around the same degrees. There isn't a Saturn Uranus hard aspect, but they're all within the same degrees. And we're also starting to get the normalization of flu. And if we push this on further then to the swine flu situation, which is 2009, is actually a return of the 1918 virus the really deadly one, the Spanish flu, but there's a few modifications on it. So they were pretty scared of it once they realized what it was. But they actually found that large numbers of the population had immunity and it only affected young people and all the old people were fine. That's really, really interesting combination. Um, and this is our old friend again, the Saturn Uranus opposition and Neptune hanging around the same degrees. So we can see we're actually starting to get a, um, it's, it's not absolutely there for all of them, the Asian flu, it's not as strongly there, but we're starting to get this sense of a Saturn Uranus and something to do with Neptune going on. And when we look at the swine flu, we see that Neptune is back in the spot again, starting to drift through the stars of Aquarius. And I'll put this into context for you as we go along. And then we move to COVID-19, which is where we are now. And we know it's no Saturn-Uranus combination. What we've got, of course, is a Saturn-Pluto combination. And 
we shouldn't sort of get too carried away with that because that happens every 33 years. So once again, this is not fitting in exactly how we would like it, except when we look at the sky again, we see that Neptune is still amongst the stars of Aquarius. It was about here with the swine flu and now it's here with COVID-19. So in a sense, this swine flu to COVID-19 has happened while Neptune is drifting through the stars of Aquarius. Now, you can't predict a lot from that, but it starts to raise up questions in my mind about the mythology attached to this part of the sky. And I just want to a little segue off, just to share a thought with you, which I think is an interesting thought that may become more useful um, as astrology pushes into the 21st century and beyond. The constellation Aquarius, not the zodiac sign, all right, the stars, the constellation Aquarius um, is, a, is believed to be a Mesopotamian constellation from about 1000 BC, if not older. It is, as you are well aware, he's pouring water from his urn into uh, the Pisces Australis, the magical fish. But he was seen as an ancient god. He was simply called the ancient one, the old one. And he was the source of all life. He poured water into the desert. It was the most revered, sacred place of the sky and gave life to everybody. That's what this ancient one did. And in visual astrology, if you're looking at people's natal sky maps in the sky, when someone has planets in this area, and for us that's sort of around the, in, in Pisces, um, this can be a very, that planet can be very bountiful. It can be a real blessing because you're in the flow of life. You're in a sense of bountifulness. And I don't mean bountifulness in terms of money or wealth. I, I mean the, the quality of life, the vitality, vitality of life, etc. So this is interesting. And I just want to draw a parallel with you. Um, this constellation has very deep parallels with something even more ancient, which the Egyptians called Happy, their god of the Nile. Now, I will stress, under no circumstances did the Egyptians look up to see Happy in the sky. That wasn't what they did. Happy was the Nile and the Nile flood. And he was the master of the river, the bringer of vegetation, the one who greens the two banks. The two banks is the land, obviously. And by the Ptolemaic period, even the Egyptians are syncretizing these two images. They use happy pouring water when they want to show the zodiac sign Aquarius in the Ptolemaic temples. So there's a direct link between the two. Happy um, was thought to live in Aswan, which is the top, the first cataract where all the boulders are in the Nile, and thought to be underground and then would pour the water out into the Nile and, and give life to everything, life to everything. And he was, he was neither male or female, he or she. This is a, um, a, a double-gendered figure of Happy. Now, if we just sit with that, and as I said, this is a little segue, it's things we can learn by researching and asking questions. We, we could today, based on this idea of happy, we could see happy is definitely the environment. Happy is definitely what we would call mother nature. So with this syncretization and this Neptune or Uranus drifting through Aquarius, the stars of when we get these pandemics, are we starting to see a sort of an astrological signature or a sky signature for issues to do with the environment, issues to do with climate change, issues to do when things get out of balance and go wrong, that type of issue. So can we, and I don't, I can't give you an answer directly on this, but I put the question to you so you can think about it as well. Can we start to think about the stars of the constellation Aquarius, marking times when they get big stuff happening in them, marking times of mismanagement, environmental mismanagement, whether that's climate change or flu pandemics. We know flu pandemics come from too much close 
human habitation when they also in close contact with domesticated animals or wild animals. That's been going on since, you know, 1500s, if not earlier, but it comes from that. It, we create the flu. Our, our cultural activities create the flu, okay? And I think in this day and age, we're all questioning our impact on the planet. And one of the impacts on the planet is, have, is flu. There are other impacts as well. The Egyptians were incredibly aware of the balance of nature. Um, and indeed, there's a great hymn to happy, or rather a, a, a warning about what can go wrong if you don't keep the land in balance and don't keep your life in balance. And this is captured in what's known as the famine stealer from Aswan. Aswan is where the Nile starts, as far as the Egyptians are concerned. And this is actually written in the Ptolemaic period, but it's written in the guise of as if it's an ancient document from thousands of years earlier. And it's basically, it's a warning. It's a notice up just where Happy lives. And it's basically saying, if you muck Happy up, you're in trouble. And it actually describes the famine in the land. If, if Happy fails, um, then the, the, the grain dries up, the scarcity of food in every way, Every man robbed his twin. Those who entered do not go out, they die. Children cried, youngsters fell. The heart of the old were grieving. Legs drawn up, they hugged the ground. Their arms clasped about them. This is, this is the Egyptians saying, whatever you do, don't upset this beautiful balance of nature. Now, we sort of have forgotten about the famine stealer, right, as you're all aware. Um, and we do struggle in our relationship with nature. And although flu isn't climate change, it definitely is, I think, comes under the umbrella of the way humans live. So with flu being how we interact with society, we can see it. In, in this link with happy with Aquarius, the stars of Aquarius in this way. This is, this is my thinking. This is one of my questions I've got there in my head now. And I'm personally going to watch as outer planets or eclipses or whatever happens in those stars for environmental or climate issues. So this is, I just put that to you. This is just this thought. That, that's come out of this research, uh, a question for exploring later, because we don't really have environmental markers per se in our astrology. And, and this could be just one, possibly just one that we can start to keep an eye on. But then we have, okay, we've got that, but we've also got this weird stuff happening with the flu. Uh, in terms of Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, you know, something's going on and it's being a little bit elusive, just like the flu. So I once again turned to Jigsaw and I thought, okay, let's just really let Jigsaw get its teeth into it. So I entered in the charts and obviously we not haven't got any locations here and I've just got a rough date for when roughly they started. The charts for the eight flu pandemics that are definitely recorded and labelled as that. The outbreak of 10, 1510, the first official pandemic, 1580, the Russian flu, the Spanish flu, the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, the swine flu, and COVID-19. And one of the good things about Jigsaw, and I'm not trying to advertise Jigsaw, it's just that it's a very convenient thing to do, is you can just put in a chart and you can say, this is a family, and I just go straight into the family section um, and let it run. So that's what I did. Now, you don't have to understand all of this screen, so don't sort of go, yeah, right? But what I basically did was I said, given that we don't have exact dates on these charts, I simply looked at Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and the node, because the node is twitching around the point, and I find nodes interesting. I simply looked at those points, and I asked Jigsaw to scan this whole heap of harmonics, and I asked it to find me if it could find patterns that involved as many charts as possible. And it came up with one in particular, this one here, which I've highlighted. And you click on it and it said, these are the flus. There's only the swine flu missing out of this. 
and it is a fifth harmonic pattern. I thought, blimey, I would have thought something like the eighth or the fourth, or not the nice, happy fifth harmonic pattern. Please, it's such a friendly little harmonic. But of course, the fifth harmonic is where things are smooth and they just flow. From So in terms of, flu doesn't get much resistance, it just runs, it just flows. So I thought, okay, let's not knock it, let's just see what we've got and keep working with it. So here's the pat the first level of the pattern it found that these charts here's the list of them here had these points on these places which is a fifth harmonic fifth harmonic is 72 degrees so every location here is 72 degrees on from the other so there's a spot here at around north sagittarius a hot degree then 72 degrees further on there's a spot here in aquarius around 10 11 or so of Aquarius. 72 degrees further on, there's a spot here about 24 degrees of Aries. And then there's a spot here amongst the charts, 72 degrees further on, um, around about five or six degrees of Cancer. And there's nothing on this Virgo spot yet. Now, I've done a lot of work with patterns like this. And when you get patterns, they really like to get filled up. The pattern has agency, it starts to act like a magnet and it wants to get things, it wants to complete itself. Now, I really do believe these patterns have agency once they're nearly full. So what I did, which is the logical step you do when you're hunting a pattern, is I kept my same points here, and I just added all the midpoints in. So I just sort of write, well, what was the Saturn Uranus midpoint, the Saturn Neptune midpoint, and just put them in and did the same search. And I half expected to find another pattern. In other words, it was spreading, it was another pattern. But I didn't, I found exactly the same pattern. It was exactly the same pattern, which just being emphasized even more strongly, but now with all the charts, with eight charts. So that's, trust me that when you're doing this sort of research, that's a real wow factor, that you actually throw in all the midpoints run the same thing and you get this pattern, the same pattern, simply emphasized even further. So let's let's look at this. Here it is here. So what we've got is we've got here's a, the outbreak in 1510 and we're picking up to Aquarius, the point in Aquarius there. Here's the 1580 still picking up to the point in Aquarius. Now just watch how it builds. Here's the 1580 again, still picking up to the point in Aquarius. Here's the 1580 again, still picking up to the point in Aquarius. Here's the 1580 again, yet again, another bang on Aquarius. This is sort of like nailing it to the ground, isn't it? Like it's really, this, this flu pandemic, which is the first official one, is really jumping up and down on the spot. And here's another one again, still to the same point in Aquarius. All, it's all Aquarius, Aquarius. And here it is again, Aquarius. So the first flu, official flu pandemic has the Saturn, Uranus, and, it's and the node, and its appropriate midpoints all pinned to that same point in Aquarius. And here comes the swine flu, right? just fitting in on the same pattern. So what else is there? Well, here's the swine flu again, still the same pattern. This Aquarius spot is hot. I think that's the best way to put it. But then we get the other ones coming in. The Russian flu comes in, which is one of the first modern pandemics, the cancer slot down here. And then we get the Spanish flu, the one, and that's Pluto. Pluto goes over this spot for the Spanish flu. So then we get this great intensity. The Spanish flu symbolism, of course, gets mixed up with the symbolism of the First World War. Do you know, like, this was not a good time on the planet. Then we get the Hong Kong flu coming in on that cancer spot. And here again, two hits. And here's our friend, the COVID-19. The transiting node has now, right now, moving over that spot, activating this pattern. 
And then in the Sagittarius spot, we have the very first outbreak, the only touch there. And then we have the Hong Kong flu in Aries. And then last, the Asian flu again in Virgo. The pattern gets complete. So we have this, we've now, it's pointed, it's found, it's got a pattern, it's got the, it's got the um, active agents, the planets, and it's, it's highlighted right at the moment with the COVID flu, not only the Saturn Pluto, but the node is actually firing off this pattern. So, Let's see if we can take this pattern, which might fall apart, but let's see if we can take this pattern out of its box and run it around the park and do what we like doing as astrologers. Let's see if we can predict future flu pandemics running this pattern. So this is, once again, a transit sheet. I'll just take this off. We've got now 19, uh, 2020 right through to 2040. So I've just looked at 40 years, right? The next 40 years. Uh, the next, the next, next 20 years. Sorry. You think, you think I could do that sum in my head, don't you? <laughs> right. Um, okay. Just simply scanning. I mean, I could do it longer, but I didn't want it to sort of get too uh, intense on the page. And this is simply a 90 degree grid now. So what this means is I've got Saturn, Nept Pluto, Uranus and Neptune and the node. And wherever they touch each other, that is when the, whatever the lines are, they're forming either a square or a conjunction or an opposition. Right? It's a hard aspect. So it's just, it's real blunt instrument stuff. Nothing subtle here. Here we've got now, here we've got the Saturn conjunct Pluto, um, and we know what's happening now. So we've got that one. Let's just label them. Here's another one. Immediately following it into next year, 21, Saturn square Uranus, hard on the heels of. Then there's one down here, the Saturn conjunct Neptune. This is right down in 2025. Here's the dates running across the top. Then we've got one here in 28, 29. Here, Saturn square Pluto. Then we've got Saturn conjunct Uranus here, 32, 33. We've got Saturn square Neptune here, 33, 34. Doesn't look like a terrific time for the planet. And here we've got Saturn opposition Pluto, 35, 36. So what we've got, oh, sorry, and the last one here, Uranus square Neptune right in 20. 40. So what we've got in the next 20 years, including the current one we've got, is we've got eight possible outer planetary hard aspecting coming together. Eight possible times where we could get a flu pandemic based on the patterns we're looking at. Now we've got to see if any of these are happening on our fifth harmonic pattern. So the next step is to look at all eight combinations individually and just to see if they pick up any of the harmonic, fifth harmonic patterns, or if they're happening when the node picks up the pattern, one or the other is fine. So here's our pattern, and here's our COVID-19. Saturn, Pluto, 24 Capricorn, while the node is five degrees of Cancer. Bang, hitting up to the pattern flu pandemic. Late 2020 to the end of 2021, we have the Saturn square Uranus. That's a really tricky combination for flu. And that's happening between six and 10 degrees of Aquarius with the node at six Gemini. Bang. It's good we're being so careful now because I think the potential for this to get a lot worse is quite high because the Saturn Uranus is the difficult one. 2025, Saturn conjunct Neptune, Nort Aries, the node at 15 Pisces, not affecting the pattern. No problems. 2028, Saturn square Pluto at 8 Aquarius Taurus. Doing, doing, doing. 
and the node is 18 Capricorn. So that is another one hitting this pattern, 2028. 2032, Saturn conjunct Uranus, pattern not being affected. 2033, Saturn square Neptune, pattern not being affected. 2035, Saturn opposition Pluto, pattern not being affected. So in the next 20 years, we've got these three times. Oh, sorry. And then 2035, the Uranus square Neptune pattern not being affected. So what we have, and I'm just pulling this to a conclusion now, is in wrapping this all together, we have this period here is, has all the signatures of a flu pandemic based on the last seven flu pandemics and this one, right? Based on the history of flu pandemics. We have this one here from 20, the year 2020 through to the latter part of 2021. And then the next one in this 20 year cycle is here, 28 to 29. That is a flu season from 28 to 29. All the signatures are there from this pattern to actually indicate another pandemic. And the rest, although they could be difficult times on the planet, the rest are not flu periods. Hopefully that makes sense to people, right, this process. So what we have now is this, what I'm suggesting is we've got some flu triggers that we can look for. We have a potential flu pattern, which is this fifth harmonic pattern that I've identified. And if we get a Saturn, Uranus, Neptune or Pluto hard aspect, that's the first thing. The first thing you've got to get is a hard aspect between these planets. And then when you've got it, you look for that hard aspect on your flu pattern on your fifth harmonic pattern or whilst you've got the hard aspect you look for the node on that pattern and it seems to me that if it's 24 Aries that's weak but it's still a flu signature if it's in the early degrees of cancer that's quite strong could be a really bad flu and so on with the other ones but particularly those early degrees of Aquarius 8 to 13 Aquarius particularly difficult so this may or may not work for the future, but it's definitely based on what has happened in the past, which is one of the ways that we work with astrology. We learn from the past to see if we can use that to look into the future. So I'll leave that on if, if people want to take a snapshot of that, because that's what this all comes down to. Whilst at the same time, I should add that I'm going to be watching outer planets moving through the constellation Aquarius in that urn. And I'm now rethinking in my head the constellation Aquarius is going to be linked to environmental climate change issues. It is happy. It is Mother Nature. It is the life force of the planet. And if you muck around with it, you're going to have problems on your hands. So um, clearly I've used Jigsaw on this and Roy Gillett found out and ET found out because I was asking them questions. And so if you're interested in Jigsaw, you can contact Roy. Um, he can do you a deal. You can contact ET with Steffi's email. She can do you a deal. But I'm not trying to do a pitch on Jigsaw. It's just that I'm using that out of the mm -hmm. box. Um, that's the tools I've got, which are very, I find very useful tools. Um, and obviously I use Starlight as well. So that's my lot. Um, that's my journey into flu, flu pandemic. And it's taken me into this fifth harmonic fingerprint in the fifth harmonic of flu. It's taken me to reappraise the constellation Aquarius and link it to deep environmental issues or, or out of balance environmental issues. And um, all I can say based on this is be aware that this is probably going to drift well into later on next year 
I think the winter in Europe could be quite difficult. Um, and uh, when it comes to 2028, we could get a return in some way to be aware of that. So, Graham, that's me done, right? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Bernadette. Uh, it was com completely absorbing and fascinating. Well, it's sort of like uh, a food it, isn't it? It's sort of like... It is, yes. yes. <laughs> Tracing a, a thread. Uh, yes. Brilliant yes. research. Thank you, Bernadette. Thank you. Um,